Arthur, I, I recall. The house rules are always the same. We have a 35, 40 minutes presentation by the presenter followed by a 15, 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes uh, for Q&A. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome Gleb Papisheva. He's uh, receiving a PhD from uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He's going to give us a presentation on the state's role in governing artificial intelligence. Uh, Gleb, the floor is yours. Uh, and thank you for thank joining us. Thank you very us. much. Thank you. Uh, let me share my slides. Yeah, can you see it? Okay, yes. Perfect. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, yep. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me. And hello, everyone. Um, as as just introduced, uh, my name is Gleb Papashev, and today I'm going to present uh, the presentation on titled the state's role in governing AI, development, control, and promotion through national strategies. Uh, just a few notes about me. Uh, my name is Gleb Papashev. I'm currently finishing my PhD at, in public policy at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And I also hold an MPA in international development from Tsinghua University in Beijing. My research are primarily my research interests are primarily concerned with AI policy and regulation, AI ethics, and different corporate govern, governance mechanisms that are being established around this technology. And so far, the results of my research have been published in several international outlets, such as Policy Design and Practice, AI in Society, Data and Policy, and the Handbook on Regulating AI and Big Data in Emergent Economies. Uh, so let's start with uh, uh, the paper that I'm going to introduce today. And before going into the details, the overall motivation for uh, writing this paper was to develop a typology of the priorities in the state's roles in governing the socio-technical system of AI based on the analysis of the national AI strategies coming from different countries. And as such, I wanted to investigate these documents to understand what countries prioritize the roles of development the roles of control and the roles of promotion of AI in these documents. And methodologically, I use a combination of two techniques, the qualitative content analysis and Latin Driclet allocation, also known as LDA topic modeling for this exercise. Um, so just to give some background for this research, uh, in the field of AI governance, generally, we can say that there are two major domains of research. The first domain looks at the algorithms as a tool of governance, and as such, how through these technologies, the government can intervene in the societal processes and change certain behavioral patterns of the population. The second strain of research, however, looks at the governance of the algorithm and as such primarily concerned with different policy and regulatory architecture that emerges around the technology of artificial intelligence. Uh, nevertheless, um, currently, this technology is primarily governed through different soft laws. And soft laws can be understood as a shorthand term to cover a variety of non-binding norms and techniques for implementing them. Even though several countries, such as the European Union or China, have been developing harder laws on this technology, um, generally, uh, there is not much going on in terms of uh, hard legislation around this, uh, this technology. And most often, it is governed by the so-called AI ethics or ethical principles that emerge um, from different stakeholders around this technology. And several researchers have been investigating such documents, and they found that there is an overall global convergence around several principles that are being introduced in these ethical documents. And uh, they argued that this process is globally converging around certain principles. However, uh, another vital policy document, which is coming directly from the government, national AI strategies, remains an, a very under-investigated object of inquiry. And as such, that was one of the key motivations for me to embark on this research project. Uh, I use, when it comes to the theoretical framework used in this study, I very much rely on the um, findings by Boris and Endler published in 2014, where 
they create a typology of different governance modes of socio-technical systems, where on one side they distinguish the hierarchical and non-hierarchical modes, and on, a, on another side they distinguish between driven by state actors and driven by non-state actor modes. And as such, the hierarchical and driven by state actors mode, which they title command and control, would be the best example of such mode would be, for example, um, nuclear power and how, how everything related to nuclear power is governed currently. While the hierarchical and driven by non-state actors titled oligopoly would be best, best described by what has been going on around um, autonomous vehicles, where a bunch of major companies around the world pretty much control the whole market regarding this technology. Uh, the non-hierarchical but driven by state actors mode, titled Primus Interpairs, is uh, best described by the initiatives that have been occurring around smart city, uh, smart cities around the world. And um, the last type, titled self-regulation, which is non-hierarchical and driven by non-state actors, is perhaps best described described by the case of cryptocurrencies and what has been going on around this particular technology. As such, uh, the data that I used in, in this paper was primarily gathered from three databases. First one is AI governance database by Nesta. The second one is the OECD AI policy observatory. And the third one is the AI ethics guidelines global inventory by the algorithm watch. Overall, I gathered 31 national AI strategies coming from 31 countries, which I manually coded using the Enviva 12 software. Here you can see uh, the list of all of the strategies uh, used in the study, where on the left is a list of countries that, um, that I included in the study. Uh, in the middle, there is a name of the document included in the study. And on the right is a year when the strategy was published. So uh, now take, let's take a look at the results of the qualitative content analysis. After inductively coding each of the 31 documents, uh, I found that there, there, there are 13 major themes which represent the state's function in governing AI, uh, which can be found in this corpus of data. And these 13 major functions uh, are human capital, research and development, regulation, support for the private sector, ethics, applications in the public sector, data, digital infrastructure, national challenges, diffusion and awareness, financial support, national security, and international cooperation. Here you can see uh, a table, a figure, where, which shows which country has which of these functions uh, included in their national AI strategy. Here, for example, we see that the countries like the UK, the Netherlands, and Singapore have quite a lot of functions of the state discussed in their national strategies, while the countries like Russia or Saudi Arabia or Uruguay have two times less types of functions of the state discussed in their uh, strategies. However, it should not be treated as a as a characteristic of the national AI strategy of its quality, because it simply means the scope of the envisioned state interventions in the governance of the socio-technical system of AI, not the quality of the document or the quality of the country's approach. Now let's take a closer look at some of these functions of the state. For example, human capital. The human capital has been mentioned in every strategy coming from every uh, included in this analysis. And it primarily describes different initiatives about, around educating people for using AI technologies, creating capacity both within the market and within the policymakers for using this technology, creating faculty positions exclusively for AI at the universities and different talent attraction programs. The next function is, for example, can be data. Data includes different policy initiatives regarding 
uh, creating the data depositories or open data depositories, so which can be used by different stakeholders in the country, sharing the data from the public sector with other stakeholders, primarily with the private sector, or creating data marketplaces. And here on the right, you can see what kind of countries mention what kind of uh, policy instruments in their, uh, in their strategies. The next one can be, for example, digital infrastructure. And digital infrastructure includes different um, infrastructural solutions provided by the state, which will be utilized by the developers and users of AI systems. And those include supercomputers, data centers, marketplaces, and for example, the creation of 5G network in the country. Another interesting one about this particular uh, function is the creation of the local language data resource, which can be primarily observed by a smaller countries who have less speakers of their own local language, such as Denmark, South Korea, or Norway. Meaning that, especially now in the era of large language models, these countries understand the importance of preserving their own language and creating the resources for developing AI models based on their own local languages. As such, these 13 functions that I just described uh, were then grouped into three major categories, which represent the overall role of the state in governing the socio-technical system of AI. The first role, titled development, includes R&D, public sector applications, infrastructure, and national challenges. The second role, control, includes ethics, regulation, data, and national security. And the final one, promotion, includes human capital, private sector support, diffusion, international cooperation, and financial support. So the second step in the study was to use LDA topic modeling uh, approach uh, on the same corpus of 31 national AI strategies to determine what kind of cluster of words or what kind of topics can emerge from it and how they can correlate with the findings of the uh, qualitative content analysis. And in order to do that, this analysis included three steps. In the first step, I pre-processed the data. I lemmatized all of the uh, text. I removed the symbols, the set words, etc. After that, I created the document term matrix. And of course, uh, modeled, uh, analyzed, and visualized the results of the model in the end. Here you can see the results for each of the topics where we find the same, same three topics as found from the qualitative content analysis in the corpus of data and the probability of word appearance in each topic. However, this table shows the most frequent words in each topic, which may not always be the most informative way to understand what has been going on with regards to uh, the contents of the topic. And as such, there is a technique to, of re-ranking the words within the topics to find less often appearing words which can have more meaning uh, behind them when it comes to the constituents of the topic. Um, and as such, here are the results of the re-ranked words in each topic. Uh, the results showed that the topic to control is the most popular one when it comes to the to its proportion in all of the 31 strategies studied in this uh, analysis, where it takes up about 39% of the whole corpus of data, while the topics of development and promotion take up around 32 and 28% respectively. Yeah, so in the last step, of the overall analysis, I wanted to see, to create a combined typology of the state's role in governing AI based on the results of both the qualitative content analysis and LDA topic modeling. And as such, in the first step, I tried to determine how many functions constituting one theme are present in the text of a strategy, and what is the proportion of this theme 
in comparison with two other things based on qualitative content analysis. And the second step, I wanted to see what proportion each topic occupies in each document based on the results of the LDA topic modeling. And as such, the final typology it would be based on adding the proportions from qualitative content analysis to the proportions from the LDA topic modeling to see which theme is emphasized more when the two are combined. Here you can see the results of theme prioritization based on qualitative content analysis for each of the countries. And we can see here that there are quite a lot of countries which equally emphasize the topics of the either two or three topics, such as, for example, Uruguay emphasizes equally control and promotion, while uh, Australia equally emphasizes development, control, and promotion. Meaning that just by looking at the results of this um, of this exercise, perhaps it's not very easy to create a meaningful typology as such. When we look at the results of the LDA topic modeling, here the situation is quite different, where most of the countries would emphasize one of the topics much more than the others. However, that's not always the case. And if we look at the cases of, for example, Luxembourg or Lithuania, which you can see on the right at the bottom of the, of the graph, uh, the situation is quite different here because almost all of the three topics are emphasized nearly equally in, this, in, in these two countries. And as such, perhaps the results of the LDA topic modeling are also not sufficient enough for the creation of typology just by itself, especially considering that it is lacking the qualitative in-depth understanding of the content of the documents. As such, uh, the combined typology, which I'm introducing in this paper, is based on the combination of the two. And let's take a look at the problematic case of Lithuania. Uh, so for Lithuania, the qualitative content analysis reveals that 20 percent of the functions art articulated in the national AI strategy are related to development, while 40 are to control and promotion. As such, control and promotion are emphasized equally in the Lithuanian strategy. The LDA topic modeling, on the other hand, shows that 34% of the strategy is devoted to the topic development, while 29 and 35 to control and promotion. And as such, we can see that almost all of the three topics are emphasized nearly equally. However, when we combine all the proportions, we see that 27% of Lithuania's national AI strategy is related to development, 34.5% to control, and 37.5% to promotion. Thus, Lithuania prioritizes promotion overall. Here's the result of uh, the whole study where I'm introducing the final combined typology of the state's role in governing AI. And uh, as such, coming back to the theoretical framework introduced in the beginning, I'm placing my three categories of development, control, and promotion into the uh, broader categories introduced uh, by Boris and um, Errol in 2014, which described the overall uh, mode of governance within the socio-technical system of any sort. And as such, when it comes to development, uh, it most closely resembles the mode of governance associated with primus inter pares, where the state takes the leading role in facilitating and initiating AI projects, and they work in close collaboration with different stakeholders to develop um, those projects with the provision, with the direct provision of the state resources. And under this mode of governance, the state prioritizes innovation over the protection of risks. And as such, countries like China, Japan, South Korea, and Russia are included into this, um, this mode of governance. Uh, the second one, mm, control is most similarly associated with the command and control mode of governance, whereas the state is taking a leading role as a guarantor that protects society from the risks stemming from AI. 
and uh, the state is developing vigorous regulatory frameworks uh, and overall sets up the rules for the game of the market through different policy initiatives by prioritizing the protection from risks over innovation. And as you can see here, most of the countries included in this block are coming from the European Union, which is famous for having a hard stance on the, um, on the governance of emerging technologies and where the one of the hardest laws for AI has been uh, recently, uh, is, is being recently discussed. And uh, finally, the, Mm, the last category title promote promotion is most similarly associated with uh, oligopoly and self-regulation and shows a more decentralized approach to to the governance uh, with the key role of the public sector uh, and uh, an overall lack of policies and regulations regarding this technology where the most of the governance is being conducted through self-organization and self regulation by the industry and overall there is a prioritization of innovation over protection from risks and as you can see here countries like the us the uk ireland or australia are included in this block so uh let's take a closer look at each of these uh categories as such development uh which will, in which we can find several European countries from the Soviet bloc, from the former Soviet bloc, Russia, and countries in East Asia, they prioritize the theme of development. They choose the primus into peers mode of uh, governing this socio-technical system, where the state takes the leading role in facilitating the collaboration with stakeholders, but the solutions are not directly developed by the state. As such, the state engages different companies or different stakeholders to help out with developing uh, the technologies. Um, it is an overall mode of governance where the state chooses the trajectory for the future development of the technology and then navigates other stakeholders on this path to create uh, an overall um, strategy to follow the overall strategy and as such it has a very high mobilizing potential for engaging various stakeholders on different uh, grant projects without compromising on rigid strategy and the best examples of such projects would be for example the social scoring system in China or the society 5.0 which is currently being developed in Japan so the topic of the role of control can be found primarily in the countries from the European Union. However, Norway, Mexico, and Uruguay are also included in this, uh, in this category. Under this mode of governance, the state takes the role of guarantor and actively protects the society from the risks that are potentially stemming from the applications of AI. And as such, it's a commanded control mode of governance where the state is the leading role in bringing change to the socio-technical system of AI. And in the long run, the markets included in this section would be primarily dependent on the different policies and regulations that are being developed by the governments in, in these areas. Uh, and that's how the rules of the game will be primarily set there. Finally, promotion includes a very diverse list of countries such as the United Kingdom, the US, Singapore, New Zealand, Ireland, and India. Under this uh, mode of governance, the state takes the role of a promoter and facilitator of AI projects. And the overall role of the state is much more indirect than in former two categories discussed before. And as such, it most closely resembles the mode of governance of oligopoly or self-regulation, where there is not much importance placed on the state's involvement in the governance of the socio-technical system of AI, and there are not too many policies and regulations regarding the development of this technology. As such, the speculation about this uh, particular mode of governance would be that it equally creates the opportunities for the big firms to take over the whole market, which some would argue is currently the case with the big tech firms such as Google and Facebook pretty much 
uh, taking the whole market when it comes to search engines or social networks. But there is also a chance that this, this approach can create a vibrant and decentralized market. So overall, the policy implications of this paper uh, are mm, in explaining the differences, how the state's role in, what is the state's role in governing the socio-technical system of AI? And as such, this, this typology would be useful for several things. For example, uh, since I, my study is based, is conducted at the emergence of the governance architecture around uh, the socio-technical system of AI, it grasps what has been happening at the very beginning. Uh, and as such, in the future, if someone would like to track the evolution of the policy architecture development for AI, it would be very useful to see at what, what roles the countries were taking in the very beginning and how this might change in the long run. Uh, secondly, it can be helpful for useful for policymakers in the countries that do not yet have any policy interventions regarding AI to decide what priority the state should take under different institutional contexts. And finally, the policy makers from the countries that are included in the typology can reconsider some of their priorities by looking at how they their country's approach compares to the approaches of other countries. And yeah, thank you very much for listening to me today. Uh, this would be the end of my presentation. And as said, this paper has been recently published in Policy Design and Practice. Uh, it can be easily accessible via the link or uh, can be seen online. And thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Glad. It was a very interesting presentation. Uh, I know that Professor Barish and Professor Knox uh, raised their hands, but I was first, so I go first. Also power of the okay. chair. Uh, I was looking at your presentation uh, with great interest and, uh, and with some a great level of curiosity. You presented a table where you group the countries uh, as being primarily focused on the development, the control, or promotion. And if you look at the category of development, uh, they're either Asian slightly authoritarian regimes or post-communist regimes. In the promotion category, it's all former British colonies, sorry calling for including Ireland as a former colony, uh, with the exception of Lithuania. And in, this case, in, the, in, the, in the category of, uh, of control, we have all these Scandinavian countries plus the Netherlands, which is all those nice places that are always very concerned about securing the freedoms of their citizens. And, and they have this rhetoric and this narrative uh, about you know, in empowering and freeing uh, the individuals and so forth and so on. And so, you know, I don't want to 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 con dispute uh, your results, but I think there is gotta be a very strong political culture reason why different countries end up in different camps, you know. And I think you know your data can be used for a much more compelling narrative that tells something more. I mean, Singapore, which is sometimes criticized for being a, not entirely democratic, you know, the same party has been in power for many years, you know, works exactly like United Kingdom, United States, which are, to the best of my knowledge, the best Europe democracies in the world. On the other hand, countries like uh, the Scandinavians, who are supposed to be, you know, the champions of do, doing good for their citizens, so allegedly, you know, they're the most concerned with control. And, and, and China, not a democracy, Russia, not sure how democratic it is these days. Uh, Hungary, shifting very much to the right, not known to be democratic, Czech Republic, former communist regimes, they don't care about control. And that's something really, really fascinating that I think will require for a customers like me, a few words of explanation, because I think there's something going on there that really needs to be addressed. Thank you very much. And sorry for the long question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for um, spotting all these differences in, in, in groupings. And uh, I, as such, I, I mean, the, the goal of this particular paper was not to rationalize the actions of this governance as such, but rather to present the typology, which would be very representative by looking at, you would understand which country is similar to which country. And uh, so there was no 
um, intention to answer why each of these countries chose the the approach that they have chosen in the end. But uh, because coming from your question, I think you, you can easily uh, find different categories uh, uh, for explaining why this has been happening. I, I guess it's one one of the signs that the typology certain degree but of course uh if you look deeper into into this you can observe very interesting deviations for example as you pinpointed hungary and czech republic are formally uh the the parts of the po post uh, post-soviet uh bloc but at the same time currently they are the parts of the european union and as such their regulation should be uh very much aligned with other regulations for for ai uh, at the European Union. And in the Union, they're currently developing the act, which would serve as an umbrella document for all of the uh, countries and would uh, have the decisive power over the local regulations. But nevertheless, when it comes to the strategies of the governments, we see certain degree of deviation there. And I believe it's, it's, a, it's a very good opportunity for developing case studies on, on those kind of regimes to see what's going on. Uh, when it comes to non non democratic countries such as China or Russia, uh, I'm quite familiar with both regulatory regimes in Russia and in China regarding AI. And I would say that even though the overall approach of the government and the the overall role, big role of the government is there, how the government approaches it is quite different. Where in China previously we've seen that the government would create a lot of possibilities and a lot of support, provide a lot of support for the big tech companies to develop competitive solutions and compete first with uh, uh, and create com globally competitive results uh, by providing them support. But currently, recently in the past two years, we see a big backlash and a big crackdown on the big tech firms in the country and a lot of regulations. And someone would argue that the Chinese regulation that is being developed for big tech is more rigorous and more harsh, is harsher than what has been developed in the European Union. Uh, while Russia, on the other hand, the state takes a leading role in this socio-technical system, but takes a very much hands-off approach when it comes to regulation, because under the sanctioning regime, the country, pretty much simply creates uh, as much opportunity for local companies like Yandex, for example, to do whatever they want on the local market. So if you delve deeper into this typology, there are very, very interesting variations that, that are happening. And perhaps it's, it's an opportunity for future studies to, to create this different vignettes of, of what, what is going on. Thanks, Gleb, for a fabulous answer. It's Professor Barish, then Professor Knox, and then Professor Karini. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. We have lost uh, Professor Barish or is muted. Omar, you're muted. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Uh, my microphone is not working. Sorry. I was thanking for a great, great presentation and it's really interesting, but uh, my question is very short and it's uh, the methodology, uh, especially if you can go to the example of Lithuania that you described uh, in three different methodologies. Lithuania is, I mean, uh, is leading in one or either promotion or development or control. Uh, when you decide, I mean, here there are basically three different methodologies. How do we know that number three is correct? I mean, obviously we don't know the like uh, outcome that we are trying to reach. Otherwise, it, the, this exercise would not be uh, would not have any meaning. How do we know number three is cor correct? I mean, do you have any robustness checks or uh, who decides? Like, okay, maybe it's uh, the first methodology is. Uh, gives more accurate uh, measures or accurate results. Who decide? I mean, what is the decision criteria here methodologically? Sure. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, for your question. So, uh, why my combined typology is based on the two methodologies is because the methods that are being used are so different from one another that they are results can very much complement each other and uh, show um, uh, 
try to explain different di the difference between the two. The first one is primarily based on the qualitative content analysis, where I would read each of the document line by line, code it, and understand what is going on in the documents. Well, in the second methodology, I'm using the LDA topic modeling, which is a machine learning algorithm, which decides what are the major clusters of words that can be found in this corpus of data and how often they appear in each of the documents. And for me- uh, so let me interrupt you here between one and two. Uh, two is more mechanical, I guess, from what you explained. And one is more about subjective on the eye of the beholder, on the eyes of the beholder. When you read it, you decide whether it is more development or more control. That's correct. Right? It's your yeah, subjective assessment. Yeah, so one is a qualitative analysis conducted by me. The second one is a topic modeling exercise conducted by a machine learning algorithm. Okay. And in the end, I combine the results of two to see if a meaningful typology can be derived. Okay, did you check any correlation between one and two? Uh, no, I did not check any correlation, but uh, even if, if from from what you see here, I think um, uh, usually most of the countries would um, have very quite a high degree of similarity between the two between the the, the yeah that, that, that's why that's why I'm uh, I mean number two mechanical assessment is like it's just appearance of words and yeah. you cannot do anything too much about it it's much more objective criteria if a word appears 20 times you cannot change it to 25 or 35 but sure. number one is more i don't know uh i'm coming objective. from behavioral yeah. background i mean it depends on when you read it if if you depend it depends on which one you read it first and then afterwards if you read like russia first and then singapore next or vice versa can affect can actually create a bias in your evaluation and that's why I was i mean uh i'm i have a couple of concerns about like finding the accuracy or which one is like like the one that we are looking for which one because based on the, your scoring in number one your scoring in number three uh, the results in number three is going to change and it's going to affect your the grouping which actually puts i don't know different countries singapore and saudi arabia at the same time, I mean, and putting Russia and more, I don't know, uh, development countries, I don't remember exactly the list, but I mean, that kind of uh, hard to explain uh, results is possible in this way. That's why I'm interested in the robustness of the results. Sorry for the interruption. No, no, thank you for an excellent question. It's actually a very good point for um, future studies like this to, to, to do what you just suggested. Professor Knox. Okay, thank you very much indeed um, for a very interesting presentation. In fact, uh, Professor Polizzo stole my question and abused his position as chair, but let me just extend it a little bit, if I may. So central to your whole argument is the, the position of the state, the role of the state. And if I can just expand a little bit on Ricardo's question. Um, I mean, if you look at some of the traditional roles of the state, um, you know, a, a typology around being a democracy, a republic, a monarchy, communist country, dictatorship, and so on. Um, I mean, I suppose I'm interested in the extent to which the role played by the state in artificial intelligence is quite different from their traditional role. I mean, maybe in a dictatorship where it's, it's very top down, very heavy on control. And if that is the case, why? Uh, looking at the artificial intelligence as a topic, that might be the case. In other words, uh, why have they varied or, or moved from their traditional stance? And is there something about artificial intelligence that uh, assumes that our, 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 where the states take on a slightly different role? I mean, I think that that would be a very interesting question coming out of your study. Just as, as a quick observation, if I may, uh, I think it would be useful for people who have no background in uh, artificial intelligence as a topic that you would actually circumscribe what you mean by artificial intelligence. You know, what, what typically 
is included in that. I mean, probably because of the shortage of time, you weren't able to do that. But um, just, just to the point that Ricardo made, I'd be very interested to know if artificial intelligence as a public policy topic is in some way changing the role of the state in some very traditional societies. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your question. And um, as such, I'm in this particular paper, uh, I'm not looking at the overall role of the state in in the entirety of the uh, social circumstances. Rather, I'm looking at what the state does when it comes to governing the social technical system in this particular case of AI, but the framework that I'm using is, is built for other technologies as well. So it's uh, it's only making the argument for the role of the state in governing the uh, the particular technologies. And as such, I'm, I'm sure that why, why it is different from other uh, societal uh, domains is that, for example, Mm, uh, in in many, if you look at what what the real the the state does with regards to um, healthcare provision, uh, I I'm sure that the typology of the role of the state and the provision of, uh, for example, free healthcare would be very much different from what has been discussed here, and uh, the roles that the state would be taking there would be quite different from the roles that it is taking in governing the artificial intelligence. Or for example, if you if you take other domains of, uh, of science or technology, that might also be the case, where if we look, if we compare, for example, the role of the state in governing AI and cryptocurrency, it's very different. When it comes to AI, the state is quite heavily involved in, in into different domains of the governance around this technology. While when it comes to cryptocurrencies, the actions of the states are usually twofold, either banning it or not doing anything about it, allowing for the market to do all of the self-regulatory things around it. Uh, and as such, I, I believe that that is, uh, that is what, what makes the, this paper special, uh, is the focus on this particular technology and the different roles that, that the states are, are taking in developing it. Professor Carini, thank you very much, Gleb. Thank you. Hello. Hello, Gleb. Nice to meet you, Artan Carini, faculty member here at JSPP. My question is very short, actually. I have been looking at the three uh, overarching categories of your model, and I've been looking at your policy implications. And in terms of the division between uh, development, promotion, and control, I think there is a lot of elements under promotion when you talk about the, um, so to speak, the behavioral aspects of the public servant. Uh, and from a behavioral public administration perspective, you have listed elements such as training, development, learning, promotion, but I don't see any of those under your policy implications. So in light of this very interesting presentation you have given us today, about the challenges of the EI when it comes to the public service management. Uh, how do you explain the lack of such uh, policy implications for the behavior of the public servant per, per se? And uh, uh, what's your take on that in terms of, uh, of the future of the, the uh, uh, behavior of public servants, so, so to speak, from a global perspective, vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the EI as an emerging uh, field of study and practice? Sure. Um, thank you very much for your question. And um, answering your, your first question, I think the implications for the public servants of this paper would primarily come from looking at different policy instruments that are introduced under different functions of the state for delivering certain uh, deliverables regarding AI. For example, uh, if someone were to look at the uh, different instruments introduced under human capital, they would be able to see how different countries are prioritizing university educations, while others are creating programs for training public servants, while, while the third ones are creating talent attraction programs for bringing the talent to the country. And as such, it would give you an understanding of where your particular country, where you're working at, is placed in amongst other countries in terms of different initiatives. Also, one of the con well, one of the functions of the state discussed in the paper is uh, the utilization of AI 
uh, within the public sector. And as such, by looking at that, you would be also, uh, as a public servant, you would be able to understand um, what kind of solutions are different countries are utilizing AI for when it comes to the actual public, public management practices and public service practices. Uh, and as such, coming out of that for answering your bigger question, what is the implication of AI for the public servants in the future? Um, at the moment, it's, it's, it, is, um, it, it is hard to predict because the speed of the development of this technology is, is very high. And what we've been seeing with the chat GPT, for example, is changing so many things. And uh, for example, my university in Hong Kong just recently released a policy which bans the usage of chat GPT tools for writing, uh, writing the papers submitted to, to the university. But at the same time, nobody in the world has any technology to be able to check if something is written by chat GPT or is it, if it's written by someone else. So there's a big- that is actually. Between... There are some works on that and uh, actually Turnitin announced that it will be, they will be able to uh, check that. Chat GPT also has a tool that gives you an idea. It's not a final result, but there are also works on that uh, front. So I, I had to correct that, sorry. Because everything is changing yeah. so fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, sure. Uh, of course, there, there, there is the research alongside explainable AI to determine why large language models, for example, come up with different solutions. But uh, yeah, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll see what's happening. But apart from large language models, there is also generative uh, pictures or generative videos, which can be used for, for different purposes, etc. cetera. And uh, I think it places a very big challenge for the public servants, not only to understand how to catch up on the wave of these technologies and understand mm -hmm. how to utilize them for their purposes, but at the same time to make sure that these technologies do not uh, essentially affect the society in a bad way. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Deb, and question. sorry for our interruptions. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for your question. Mr. Siddiq? Yeah, thank you, Prof. Uh, Dr. Glave, for your uh, presentation. It's very interesting, and of course, uh, this is an emerging field. Uh, I have a slightly different question. I don't know whether this was within the scope of your study. Uh, I find your typology and, of course, the, the uh, spotting of different countries under those classifications quite useful. But I was just wondering whether uh, under each of these, for example, this control, promotion, and development uh, kind of uh, areas or regulations, you have any kind of uh, best practices against which the performance of other countries could be assessed. Uh, currently, of course, uh, you have focused only on 31 countries, but of course, there are other countries also. They are also struggling and, of course, coming up with new policies, what to do and what not to do. So some kind of benchmarks, international standards perhaps could be useful for policymakers and practitioners and so on. Just your comment and uh, whether you, you manage to look at those or consider those aspects as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent question. And uh, my answer would be that I believe at the moment it's quite hard to come up with any normative solutions or suggestions on what to do with regards of these technologies, because if you look at when the documents were published, the first one was published in 2017, but most of the documents were published in 2020 or 2021, meaning that the strategies of the countries have been announced, what, a year or two ago. And as such, it's, I believe the effectiveness of different approaches are very hard to measure as of yet, just because of the lack of any empirical data. And especially if, Another question is what, what exactly someone would like to measure, whether how it affects innovation or like how, how many startups or how many patents have been generated in a country, or if someone wants to understand how well the strategies protect the consumers within those markets. And that would be a very different study. And at the same time, the, the landscape of the uh, policy network around AI is not only limited to national AI strategies. They are also regulatory documents coming out from different countries as well, which set a more rigorous legal infrastructure for these technologies and which would have a different effect 
or on or on the markets as well. And uh, yeah, so answering shortly, I believe that right now it's very hard to understand what would be considered the best practice out of out of this uh, landscape of what 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 kind of approaches different countries are taking. So it's a we'll have to wait and see. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ha. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Galeb. Uh, very interesting and then uh, hot issues topic. And um, uh, my question is more on methodology or technical one. You use there's a 31 uh, strategy. Uh, and then you, you said just before uh, it covered from 2017 and, and 2021. So it's a gap. So during that time, maybe uh, state policy may, might be changed. Also, so um, my question is um, this 31 strategy, how you choose it? Because uh, state, uh, each country have uh, their many uh, statement, uh, strategy plan, you know, so, so which strategy you choose is, is important. And then uh, when you do the, uh, the LDA, uh, the topping model, usually uh, uh, topping model, you know, uh, uh, when you uh, set up, yeah, and then it categorized development and then control and promotics. And then uh, uh, which words that belongs to this development or control or promoting, how often they show up, and then it's positive meaning or negative meaning, they control or control it. But the LDA model is more, looks like more complicated. Do you predicting or something? Could you explain more detail about not not too much detail, but uh, try to understand how you use this, uh, the LDA model means. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Answering your first question, uh, what I did is that at first I gathered national AI strategies, meaning that the strategies produced by the governments, which are exclusively related to AI technology. So it has to be a document exclusively dealing with this technology. It cannot be an overall technology strategy. It cannot be an overall national security strategy or anything else. It's only uh, a national AI strategy related to this technology. So at first I gathered uh, all of the documents from as many countries as I could. And after that, I um, excluded the countries for which I would not be able to find an official English translation for the document and as such ended up with 31 countries. Um, answering your second question, uh, the, how, so how the process of LDA modeling works is that in the beginning you have the corpus of, of the texts. Uh, you first uh, clean the data, you okay. clean, clean the text, you lemmatize everything, you remove the stop words, um, the punctuation marks, et cetera. Um, and after that, um, you use a benchmarking tool. There, there are four ben major benchmarking tools. I, I would not be able to remember the names of the authors of those tools uh, to determine what is the most probable, a meaningful number of topics in the corpus of the text. And usually it would give you a range of topics, say from three to seven, where the, the algorithms would think that they would reveal the most meaningful results. And after that, it's a trial and error exercise of, of you saying what, what happens when you run a uh, different number of topics where the, the algorithm based on its understanding of the whole corpus of data would group those uh, documents around different uh, words that it sees most connection between. So, okay, so you, you, you said uh, each country have a one strategy you choose, and then you analyze. No, right? you analyze how many you analyze how many all, uh, all, of, all of the all of the strategies all together. Okay. Okay. But then when you see the topics, it you can see how each topic is prioritized in each of the countries. Mm -hmm. Do you use uh, R or Python? Which program R. did you use it? I, I use it. R. Yeah. Just a technical question. There, there are several softwares that political scientists developed to capture priority position in political space to compute word scoring. So <clears throat> what was the advantage of using uh, the machine uh, or the software that you use over or, or doing the programming in, in R, Python, whatever, instead of using word scoring softwares that are already 
you know, widely used in political science? Uh, well, one would argue that you know, that topic modeling is a is a more advanced technique that reveals uh, more interesting results. And second of all, because it's a it's a machine learning um, exercise, the, the 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 benefits and the uh, the drawbacks of it is that the interpretation of the results might be quite challenging. And as such, uh, on one hand, it can be answering one of the questions about the benchmarking of the uh, of the rigorousness of the study that can be one of the um, positive sides when it comes to arguing for its objectivity. And uh, and another thing is that uh, the, the corpus of data was quite large because um, I used 31 strategy and each strategy is maybe around 100, 150 pages. And I believe that the topic modeling is, is quite good for that. All right, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. No, no more customers. Uh, I can ask one more question, actually. Yeah, go ahead. Go it's ahead. a minor question about the methodology again. How did you control for errors in translation? Especially when you, when you are counting the words, I mean, there are like different words that can be translated in diff by different words. Uh, did you look like some kind of a synonym check or uh, I don't know how to give examples of this, like uh, like power can be translated into something which actually is true for some languages, which can be retranslated re into English as force. So, but power and force are different and then it's not going to show up as a repetition of the same word in when you actually count the words. How did you control for the, those kind of errors or the, those kind of preferences by the translator? Sure, uh, thank you for, for your question. Uh, I did not control for, for those things and it's an excellent question and uh, an excellent exercise to do in the future. But uh, the, I only used the official translations provided by the governments. So as such, there was no translation work coming out from me. And you know, if I would use the Japanese strategy, that would be uh, the Japanese strategy, which is translated by the government of Japan into English and published as such. Okay, thank you. It's a, it's a minor issue, but th th there is some. Thank you, thank Something you. It's a, it's a it's an excellent point for uh, for people who are using all these natural language processing techniques to to understand those kind of things. It's, mm -hmm. it's a good thing to, to keep in mind. Right. If you don't have a, any additional question, this is uh, the end of our session. Thank you very much, Gleb, for a very interesting presentation and for the lively debate uh, that it triggered. Thanks to all the participants for being with us and for asking very smart question, not just the chair today. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, see you hopefully very soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.